Okay, I've, I've done a little thing on here, and I want to talk to you a little bit about waning and uh, some of the ramifications of what he did. But I, I, I did this so that you would kind of get a feeling for what's going on. The numbers are the numbers of the patriarchs. And uh, in some traditions, you receive uh, a lineage chart when you take ordination. I've always wanted to do it here. In China, we talk about, we start with Bodhidharma as the first Zen patriarch. Don't ask me where he is on the lineage chart, because I'd have to go look. And if I couldn't put my hand on the chart right away. But someday we'll, we'll have those little lineage charts. In one school, this school over here, Sao Tung School, which when it goes to Japan, becomes the Soto School. Okay, And this is actually not a master. This is, this is two masters, and their names are combined to give the name to the school. And this is the other side, which when it goes to Japan, becomes the Rinzai school. Okay? And these are the two existent schools from the original schools they had. Um, and each one was a slight difference in teaching. And the important thing here is that these lineage lines all come from Huayning. So that any lineage line you look at in existence will have the first six in it. Okay? They'll have the first six in it, and then they'll split off. And in the Rinzai school, this becomes very, very interesting because the Rinzai school has <laughs> hundreds of lineage lines. In the Soto school, they have two. Okay? That split off of here. But these are like, Hairs on a head. They just go all over the place. So in Soto tradition, depending upon where your lineage line was coming from, which would be determined by where you were ordained, the, the big the big temple or the where you trained, you only have two choices. You got a fifty fifty chance of knowing somebody else's lineage line. Okay? Well, this is a big important thing. I told you before, this is important. This lineage line is simply important because Zen at one point turned around and looked backwards and said, okay, you're going to call us heretics, but we need to let you know that whether you call us heretics or not, we have a direct connection with the historical Buddha. So two ways of talking. One is to go all the way back to Mahakashapa and the recognition of his transmission, and the other is to start with Bodhidharma, who is, has been picked as the person that we're going to call the great Zen master, the beginner of Zen. In Bodhidharma's time, just before Bodhidharma, there was an interesting thing that took place. And it's really very Zen in the way Zen approaches the mind. Because sometimes it's all, you know, it's tricking the mind. And there was a school known as the Yogacara school, and that translates as the mind-only school. And their perception was that reality is created by the mind. Well, that's kind of what the Buddha said. But they took it to the extreme. So coming down to Bodhidharma, we have these people that are practicing in the Yogacara school, which is heavily into meditation, and it's heavily into a recognition that the mind is the source of our problem and the way it's perceiving things. While this is going on, Buddhism is a highly established religion in China. It's been there a long time. And we now have uh, ritual, and we have ceremonies, and we have institutions, and we certainly have organized religion, and, and we have hierarchies, and we have the licensing of monks by the state who needed to control how many people went into the religious order. They needed to control how many temples they were. They were kind of keeping three balls in the air, remember? Did we talk last week? I'm confused. Okay, they got those three balls. They got the Confucius that want their temples. They've got the Taoists that want their temples. And then we have this foreign religion. Now, you need to understand, Buddhism stopped being a foreign religion in, in China when um, the Mongols came in. When the Mongols took over China, and we now had the Mongol dynasties, um, people went to the great Khan and said, uh, Buddhism isn't really a Chinese religion. It's a foreign religion. These are our true religions. And the great Khan, of course, was a foreigner and said, you want to run that by me one more time? 
We don't like Buddhism because of why? Well, because it's an imported religion. It's a foreign religion. And of course, the Mongols immediately embraced Buddhism. They saw that the best reason of all to make it the state religion. And from then on, Buddhism was in pretty good shape. The other religions didn't get punished or anything, but they, that high-handedness they had of getting all the favors kind of went away with the Mongols. So we come down through these three guys. Remember Bodhidharma? He has this encounter. Well, before him, one of the methods they use, which I find fascinating, which is recorded in the transmission of the lamp, is that some of the masters would kind of build a mental construct for their students. In other words, they would, through the mind and through the words, um, build a version of reality that was so bulletproof, so perfect, that the students would all accept it, and then they would methodically tear it down and prove how it was wrong. And, of course, in attempting to do this, they attempt to let their students be free of these mental constructs. Um, it's a very difficult way to practice. Um, it's, it's, it's hard on people's perceptions. If I take all of your beliefs away, all the things that you've ever thought were real, then what are you left with? Well, you're left with reality. But some people, it's very, very important that what they believe is right. It's like the guy that voted Republican all his life, and when he's 82 years old, he discovers he was wrong all his life, or Democrat, whatever it would be. It's kind of earth-shattering, you know, particularly when you got into fights and you yelled at people and you got mad at your friends and never talked to them again because of some belief you had that was totally wrong. Well, that's what those masters tried to do. When it came down to Bodhidharma, we get down to pure sitting. And Bodhidharma is not going to have a discussion anymore. He's not going to do these mental constructs. He's going to say, just sit. And you're going to sit facing a wall. And the facing the wall is, is uh, particularly important. The Soto school continues to face the wall because it cuts down on the amount of stimulus that comes in. And so we get this quiet sitting. And we're not going to, we're not going to exercise our mind to try to disprove anything. We're going to quiet our mind to see reality as it is. Now, in one, one group of critics, because obviously if we have many houses, we have the eight houses of Zen, not everybody agreed. The critics would say that they were just sitting kind of in a stupor and that they couldn't see reality because they didn't go out and engage it with their mind. But the people that were sitting silently said, no, it's not a stupor. We're letting go of all these false notions so that eventually what's left is reality. We're not going to give any weight to one idea any more than the other. We will experience reality as it is. And then we have Wei Ko, who is famous because of the cutting off of the arm. The third patriarch I left off, which gave us the relative and the absolute that we normally chant on Sundays. We come down to Hung Jen who is now in a, talk about organized religion, he's in a uh, temple, it's estimated there were 3,000 monks there, and there were 1,500 lay people in attendance, so we've got 4,500 people living in a little Zen center. Okay, It's so big that they have their own rice thrashing room to polish the rice, and we have arriving the barbarian, who is not a monk, who is not literate, 